Hi. Hi. Hello. I can do Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to Christ Central. Welcome to Christ Central. Welcome to Christ Central. Welcome to Christ Central. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Central. I'm Andrew. I'm one of the pastors. And although we can't meet in person right now, we're so thankful that we can continue to worship online. If you're new and you haven't get, gotten plugged in yet, we would love to connect with you on a personal level and welcome you to our church. Would you visit our website and fill out a connect card? And for every connect card that gets filled out, we will donate $10 to a local nonprofit that you can choose from a list. So help us to connect with you and help us also to connect with our community. When it comes to offering, you can give online, by text, or by mail. Today, I just have two important announcements for us. The first is about our upcoming drive-in worship service. Our next drive-in service will be Sunday, January 24th at 11 a.m. at the Artesia campus. You can sign up starting next Sunday, January 17th at 5 p.m. And because uh, because parking spots are limited, you're going to have to RSVP. So make sure that you sign up. Uh, Of course, one of the special features about our drive-in worship services is that we get to partake in communion together. And it's such a special blessing during this season as we're reminded of what we maybe once took for granted, just a blessing of physically meeting together in person. And so if you're open and willing, we encourage you to join us for a drive-in service and partake in communion together. For the rest of us, we also have our regular online service every Sunday at 10 a.m. Our second announcement is about our upcoming congregational meeting, and this will be on Sunday, January 31st at 1 p.m. This meeting is going to be virtual, and we are inviting all of Christ Central to be a part of it. To attend, you're going to have to register by visiting our website, and in doing so, a Zoom link will be sent to you an hour before the start of the meeting. There will also be a time of Q&A, and so we encourage everyone to be there so that you can also ask any questions that you may have. Due to the sensitive nature of financial information, current Christ Central members who have registered for the meeting will also be invited to uh, join a separate financial report portion of the meeting. We hope to see you there. For these announcements and all other church announcements, you can visit our website, sign up for our weekly e-newsletters, And you can also stay connected with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify. Today, our call to worship comes from Psalm 147.1. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Sometimes it might not feel like we want to praise God. Sometimes the feelings don't come first. We don't start with it. But it's as we praise him that they come and they lag behind after. A song of praise is fitting because God is worthy. And it is he who deserves all of our praise that despite changing circumstances, he doesn't. And so it is fitting this morning as we gather to praise him together in one voice. Let's do that now. around 
of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to the Each Sunday, we want to take time to confess our sin together. Our sin is what separates us from God. And the Old Testament made that really clear with a physical representation of the veil. There was a veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. 
And this veil, which represented our sin, served to say access denied, sinners are not welcome. Maybe today you feel that dividing wall. Maybe you feel a guilty conscience. And that veil makes it so clear that you're not good enough. And that's, that's good, I'm glad, because nobody is. In the Old Testament, no one was good enough, and this served as a reminder that someone would come later on that would be, and Jesus would get rid of this veil once and for all. Jesus invites us now to come before him, to confess our sins, to repent and turn to him in trust. Would you do that now? Let's confess honestly and vulnerably to our God together. Would you now hear these precious words from Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 23? Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see, the worst part of sin is that it gets in the way of our relationship and we lack confidence. We wonder, can I approach God? Would you be reminded today to have confidence, to have full assurance in your heart that if you've confessed and if you've turned to Jesus in trust and hope, then you have access, and not just any kind of access, you have the most intimate access to the holiest of places, the very presence of God. This is such great news for us, and so we respond in kind as we sing this next song together. Thou hast 
has cleansed and sanctified me. Thou thyself hast set me free. Who is love? Who is love will not remember? Who can cease to sing his praise? And he can never be forgotten. Throughout heaven's eternal. At this time, we want to confess our faith together. And as a part of our worship, we're going through the Heidelberg Catechism. A catechism is a summary of Christian doctrine and in question and answer format. And it summarizes really the basics of our faith, connecting us with God, but also with one another, that we hold to a faith that is shared. And so we are brought into the family, the household of God. Let's do that now as we confess in one voice from question 126. I'll read the question. Let's read the answer together. What does the fifth petition mean? Together. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors means because of Christ's blood, do not hold against us poor sinners that we are, any of the sins we do or the evil that constantly clings to us. Forgive us just as we are fully determined as evidence of your grace in us to forgive our neighbors. Hello, everybody. The title for today's message is Trust in the Lord. And the scripture reading comes to us from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I'll read this for us. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So today we're talking about trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Now trusting in and of itself is not foreign or that difficult, because we're doing it all the time. We're doing it all the time. Uh, We fall asleep trusting that we will continue to breathe and be able to wake up the next morning. Uh, We trust in our physical and mental and psychological conditioning and health. Uh, We trust in education, trust in our past experiences and judgment. We trust in our skills. We trust medicine and certainly trust in money. We trust in the great U.S. of A. I trust in myself until this pandemic came uh, rolling along and dropped a wrecking ball, <clears throat> right? A wrecking ball on so many things that we just assumed we can trust. So I'm not going to offer a definition of what trusting is, but what the Proverbs is telling us to do is we need a radical redirection of our trust. We don't have a hard time trusting things. It's where do we direct our trust? What does it mean to trust in the Lord? Who is trusting the Lord? What does it take? What does it take? Three parts. Three parts in this very familiar, loaded passage. Three parts to trusting in the Lord. And then we'll close with a promise. Okay, first. Second half of verse five. To trust in the Lord means, first, do not lean on your own understanding. Okay, do not lean on your own understanding. See, what is your understanding? What is your understanding of... All that's going on these days. Not much going on, right? (laughs) Uh, It is impossible to know all the things that are going on. I think part of what keeps our heads spinning and anxiety is high and just a perpetual sense of confusion and lostness and just anxiety is access to information. It's an overload 24-7. So not only is it impossible to know all things, stay on top of everything, let alone... The ability to have a sophisticated, well-researched, nuanced take on everything. Here's what the here's what the proverb is telling us. First and foremost, to trust the Lord means you never put your reason or your ability to figure everything out first. See, your ability to figure things out is it's second best at best. It's second best at best. You know, there's a common temptation for really deep, heavy long thinking types 
And this is a good, good thing to have. But the temptation is, well, if I can't eventually figure these out, if I can't fi figure all these things out, then nobody can. Well, you know, try telling a five-year-old who is just smashing through donuts and just, you know, face deep in a pot of ice cream during dinner. Try telling five-year-old, explaining to him why that is so wrong, why that's so bad. Uh, because, you know, there's a gap of knowledge, just a gap of life experience between you and a five-year-old. You don't think that that gap between God and you, God and me, is far greater? Look, to be a Christian does not mean you have less understanding or you use your understanding less. No, to be a Christian means you do not lean on your own understanding first and foremost. And instead, you have someone far greater, smarter, superior, wiser, loving, and liberating, sanctifying that you can trust. Trust in the Lord means you do not lean first and foremost on your ability to figure things out, especially figure everything out. Here's a second way or second uh, specific uh, way that we lean back on our understanding. Second is, I would say that this is under grave, grave threat now because it's been uh, with so much confusion for so many years, is our notion of freedom. Lean not on your understanding of freedom. The popular notion is, I am free insofar as I get to do what I want to do. Nobody should get in my way. Especially I live in the U.S. of A., this greatest country on earth, which has put into the Constitution my personal freedoms. And you cannot rob me or take away uh, my notion of it. But if your notion of freedom is strictly... Nobody can ever get in my way. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's negative. You're, you're free from all these other things that can get in your way. Then I'm sorry to tell you that that notion is imploding right before our very eyes. And it's self-defeating. Now, Os Guinness, in a 2012 book entitled A Free People's Suicide, he made this observation, quote, Sustainable freedom depends on the character of the rulers and the world alike and on the vital trust between them both of which are far more than a matter of law. Together with the Constitution, these habits of the heart are the real, complete, and essential bulwark of American liberty. A republic grounded only in a consensus forged of calculation and competing self-interest can never last. See, what is the kind of freedom, not that the U.S. of A can bring, but that Jesus brings? Because after all, Jesus was the freest and most fulfilled human being who ever lived. And the notion of freedom that Jesus brings is not that you are living for and looking out for number one. No, Jesus gave up himself in love for us all. Romans 8.32. That's the kind of freedom and fulfillment that he brings. So, to trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding. Your own, under, your own ability to figure out things. Second example, just your own notion of what freedom should be. Second, with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know, the first part, we just talked about some kind of brain food stuff. But here, we're talking about experience. The feelings dominant on our hearts. See, you can believe in God. There are a lot of people who believe in God. Do God things, do religious things, and you can be also be very devoted, but you don't actually really trust God in your heart. And we can become so good at hiding this reality from ourselves until something goes horribly wrong. Or again, until the things we used to so trust, just assume that they would always work, stop working. And then if you find that when your career or your loved ones or your own health starts to falter and you are overcome with all kinds of excessive, despondent, sad, angry, depressive, yes, life is not worth living type of feelings, 
This ought to indicate to you and I that all along we have put our trust in other things but God. And when our emotions and our hearts are susceptible and volatile and completely, uh, I would say, fragile, that when the things you used to trust are actually taken away from you, they start to erode, they start to fail and disappoint you, our hearts are a really, really first telltale sign of who really is your Lord? Who have you been? Who, who have you been trusting? <laughs> you know, in chapter three, verses twenty-four and twenty-five. But those who have learned and been trusting in the Lord, it reads this: If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or the ruin of the wicked when it comes. Verse twenty-six: For the Lord will be your confidence, and will keep your foot from being caught. How do you trust in the Lord? Lean not on your understanding. Second, you have to have your heart captured. Captured. You have to rally and position your heart so that all of your heart would be caught up in trust for the Lord. Because if the Lord does not have your heart, if the Lord does not have all of my heart, whatever is capturing your heart will fill it with so many other negative and debilitating feelings and thoughts. <laughs> so if your heart is troubled, if you feel like it is having a hard time believing and hoping in these days, you're trembling, you're scared, you have a cold heart, you know what you ought to do? You got to take your heart and put it near a fire until it warms up. And one of the most common uh, analogies of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, not even now, the Holy Spirit did show up as a fire. And if your heart is cold and trembling, wavering, you need to keep putting your heart near that fire. Don't just put it there for a little brief second. You got to put it closer and closer and keep it there. Because if the Holy Spirit is a fire, the Holy Spirit loves as an all-consuming fire using certain things to burn. There are a lot of things that the Holy Spirit loves to use to burn and warm up our hearts. The scriptures of God, singing the scriptures of God, the sacraments that we're able to take now as we come to drive through worship, fellowship, albeit over Zoom, private meditation, and of course, prayer. The extended time of prayer, you pray until you do feel that your heart is being warmed near and by the fire of the Holy Spirit. And if you keep putting your heart there, if you keep putting your heart there, as Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You see, wherever you direct and keep putting your heart, your heart will continue to rally and follow. You know, John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, he once wrote to his grieving sister who suffered a tragic loss. Here was his counsel to his sister. When you cannot see your way, be satisfied that he is your leader. When your spirit is overwhelmed within you, he knows your path. He will not leave you to sink. He has appointed seasons of refreshment, and you shall find that he does not forget you. Above all, keep close to the throne of grace. If we seem to get no good by, attempt, by attempting to draw near him, we may be sure we shall get none by keeping away from him. We can be sure we will get none, no grace, no mercy, no help by keeping away from him. Oh, so trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. <laughs> Sounds so simple, but it's maybe one of the hardest things to do to trust in the Lord. Lean not on your understanding second. You got to give him all your heart. You got to keep having your heart. You want your heart to be captured with trust in the Lord. Third part, the last part. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. All right, here's the key. So trusting in the Lord, or to grow in wisdom, trusting the Lord is the first step, one of the first steps of growing in wisdom, is not a one-time pill to take. Uh, it's not a magical incantation. It's not a lightning bolt from the sky. But notice how he describes it here. It's a path. To trust in the Lord requires a path. To grow in wisdom takes a long and patient path. 
It develops over time. Uh, it's gradual. It may seemingly be ordinary and mundane and boring at times. But a path means there's certain things you got to learn and practice and do over and over and over and over and over again until it becomes a part of you. You see, until you grow in wisdom. And the results of the fruit of a wise life are extraordinary. It's off the charts. Now, there's so many people who want God, and they've asked me to in the past many times, you know, Pastor, can you just can you just tell me what God wants me to do? I date this person, marry or not marry? Should I somehow cling and keep this business open this year or not? Should I take that risk or not? And you just say, you know, God, just tell me and give me some specific instructions. It would be nice. And if you are totally lost or unsure, okay, go seek out wise counsel. I'm glad you're talking to me or other people in the church, church that you can trust. But the Bible actually tells you and I how you, you, you yourself and I can become a wise person. In all your ways, you see, in all your ways, in all of life, here's how you become a wise person. To trust in the Lord means having the right person to follow on your path. To trust in the Lord means having the right person to follow on the path. So instead of wanting just specific, detailed guidance for everyday life matters, God has given us a mother load of clear and explicit, broad and binding directions to trust and follow. Uh, examples of this right here in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. God clearly says, generosity over greed. Faithful giving, even over the fear of preserving and saving everything for yourself. The second example in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. Different versions of this that we would call the Sermon on the Mount. And this perhaps might be the most challenging thing that Jesus ever commanded. Verse 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and evil. See, God not only gave us clear instructions on what to do with our wealth and material goods. He gives us clear instruction on what to do or respond to those who hate you. <laughs> Return love for those who hate you, or else those who hate you will continue to control you. Third, last example, what should you do when you're so anxious and worried and afraid? Matthew chapter 6, verses 25, there Jesus says, therefore do not be anxious, do not be anxious. Don't, don't, don't worry so much over everything. What you shall eat or drink or what you shall wear. Instead, God gave us instructions of what you should do. Look and consider how God takes care of all of the created world. How much more will he take care of his own children whom he loves? Whom he loves. And to become a wise person... To grow in trusting the Lord, you have to take those broad and binding, clear and explicit commands and instructions and do them over and over and over and over. Yes, you're going to have trial and error. Yes, you're going to fail to do them. But you need to continue to do that until it becomes your dominant understanding up here. And then it settles down and captures your heart down here. And then wisdom becomes a part of you. Wisdom actually becomes a part of you. Uh, I remember when I was going to Gordon Conwell Seminary, <clears throat> one of the most unforgettable experiences I had was taking an archaeology tour uh, with several of my fellow students over to Israel and Jordan. And and then a friend of mine, you might remember Peter, Peter Trotman and I extended that uh, for an extra week down to uh, Cairo, Egypt. And man, the sights and the sounds and the type of things that I... Uh, was able to uh, enjoy our, you know, they're, they're once in a lifetime type of experiences, which I'm so thankful for. 
But, uh, you know, when we got down to Egypt, it's just Peter and I. And look at us two guys completely out of place. And, you know, how do we get around when we're down in Egypt? I guess one way would be, you know, go purchase a map, get the most updated, detailed map, and, uh, you know, open that up and decipher and figure out where you want to go and, you know, map out your days. And, and I think maybe there's some of you who want that for your life, right? You, you want the grand map. You want God to just give you the whole blueprint, right? And then, of course, just kind of leave you alone so you can decipher, navigate, plan, and just, you know, run your own way. Well, luckily for Peter and I, we never had to purchase a map. Uh, it's because we had a local missionary friend, a well-traveled local who had been living there for years. And all he did was he walked with us and he just guided us around and we had the best time of our lives. I felt like that was simpler, savvier, and there was way more freedom and enjoyment along the way as well. Now, I know that an analogy breaks down in so many different ways, but so much like that, do you know that God isn't just going to give you a roadmap to the rest of your life with every specific instruction along the way? He's going to give you something better. He's going to give you the right person for you to trust and follow at every road, every crook, even at every dark valley. He tells you to turn right or turn left, or he tells you to stay still. And the more and more you learn to trust in the Lord, every step of the way, in all your ways, acknowledge Him, you will grow in wisdom. You have a living person, not a principle. You don't have a pet answer. You have something better than a map. You have the best of men. Trust in the Lord. How? Do not lean on your understanding. You have to do it with all your heart. Learn to have all your heart captured, warmed, Third, have the right person to trust and follow. And then here is the promise. This is it. We close and here's the promise. And he will make straight your paths. And he will make straight your paths. You know, for all this talk of trust in the Lord and things will usually go right and you will be blessed and honored with long life and riches and you can sleep at night, secure. This is the usual pattern according to wisdom literature. But so often, more often than not, haven't you and I failed to trust in the Lord and to follow? Haven't you and I turned to our own reasoning or instinct or someone else that we would rather trust and follow because it just felt so right to me and that's really what I wanted to do most at that moment? Well, here is gospel. Here's good news for you. Friends, you know, Jesus did not come down because you and I always make the right choice. Jesus did not have to come down because you and I always get it right. No, he only came down because you and I, more often than not, get it wrong. We get it dead wrong. We do not do Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. You know, this passage is not in the Bible, assuming that we would keep it perfectly so that Jesus would never have had to come down for our rescue. And yet, here's the promise. Even when you and I go way off that path, we just completely veer off that path. We refuse, and sometimes we're obstinate, or we're forgetful. He can still make straight your paths. We have a God who can make even unpleasant paths. And the roughest, the most consequential and broken and darkest and loneliest paths. Sometimes those paths that seemingly, it doesn't seem like it'll ever end. God will make straight even, every, even those paths as well. Because God is a redeemer. God is the one who can make straight out of every crook, crooked path. He is the one who can make everything worthwhile. For Romans chapter 8 verse 28 tells us, for God causes all things, all things, good or evil, wise or foolish, when we were trusting God and when we don't, He can cause even all those things to work together for good. Work together for good. For who? For who? To those who trust Him. 
to those who trust Him. To those in all your ways, in all of your life, you have the right person now to follow. And I can't believe it as 2021 has begun that uh, my oldest daughter, Taylor, I kept saying in years past, oh, next year, next year, she's going to go to college. No, um, she starts college this fall. And I think one of my most persistent prayers for Taylor and Elizabeth has been, will continue to be, God, I just don't want my girls to have biblical information, the right proof text, the right biblical answers when a question comes up. No, man, I, I hope they grow up to be daughters of God who have the ability to make wise choices, who have the right person to follow along their path. And before I panic and get overcome with the thought of how limited and distorted and lazy my own passing on of wisdom has been as a parent, as a failing parent, the gospel does come to my relief and rescue for me as a failing parent and for my daughters as they grow, that they will find and be able to trust and follow a much better person on their path, a much better person on their path. Listen, my friends, Jesus Christ is far more interested. Not that you make every decision right. Not that you have to get everything right. But even when you get it wrong, He came all the way down to live and to die for you. He, although He trusted in the Lord with all of His heart, He ended in complete ruin. He got the path you and I deserve so that when you trust Him, come to Jesus, give Him your understanding. Give Him all your heart in all, in all your ways and now in all of your life. Acknowledge Him. Trust and follow Him. You now and I will be able to walk and experience the path that He deserves. <laughs> he gets the path that you and I deserve so that you and I get to enjoy eternal life, abundant life with Him on the path that He earned. He earned. Oh, my friends, in 2021... I don't know any other hope. I don't know any other better guidance. I don't know any other greater person than Jesus Christ in the gospel who will not only carry you through 2021, but he will carry you all the way home. Oh, may it be so. May God make this real upon your mind, your heart, and continue to direct all your trust in all your life. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, I thank you for the riches and the power and the depth of your word. We have no ability to understand or to apply it by ourselves. So I pray, Holy Spirit, you would take this and change lives. And God, even now, if there be anyone who is groaning, troubled, weary, weak, and scared, and lonely, Lord, bring them to your Son, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ alone, who saves, who loves, who makes all our paths straight, no matter where we come from. Oh God, to you be all the glory and our, for our salvation and joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
could I ever respond but to fall and adore? I live to know you more, Lord, I will ever trust you, Jesus, trust Christ Central family, would you now receive this benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine down upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore.